Russians have learned that there is an asymmetry in conventional warfare. The Russian military does not match that of the United States by far. How do you then balance out that asymmetry? One way to do that is to invest in much cheaper measures, these non-conventional active measures, to try to weaken Western institutions, undermine Western democracies, versus sending in the tanks. Putin realizes that if we're divided as a nation, we cannot protect ourselves from threats within and without. From the Russian point of view, political warfare is just part of the art of war. What they're driving at over the longer term is to watch democracy crumble from the inside out. I'm sitting with him at dinner. I told him I'd been at the uh, memorial of the siege of Leningrad. And he said, I'll tell you a story. He said, my father was one of those people who was on the front lines and had gotten 24 hours off to go home. As he was walking down the street to his apartment, he saw a big pile of bodies, which was not at all uncommon. He saw a leg sticking out and a shoe on the foot, and he recognized that as being his wife. So he stopped and he screamed and said, oh, that's my wife, that's my wife, I want my wife. The body collectors told him to leave and he kept demanding. At this point, he's pulling his wife from under the pile. He took her to their apartment and nursed her back to health. And then after the war, she gave birth to Vladimir Putin. Putin sees himself as literally pulling the body of Russia out of the pile, the dustbin of history. You know, we are going to revive you. You are not dead, and I will take care of you. I mean, that is the, the mindset. I think his ambitions always were to be the president and then gather all the instruments of power into the presidency. His devotion to reasserting Russia's greatness is certainly in his self-interest because he wants to be the czar. He wants to be the richest man in the world, and he wants to settle scores. He made his way up through the KGB. His role in the KGB was to support Russian intelligence officers living under assumed identities, under deep cover inside the United States, and developing active measures to impact the policies of the United States. The KGB was power. If you said that you were with the KGB, doors would open people would stand aside. In 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, every republic that emerged from the debris of the Soviet Union agreed at the time to recognize the republics in their then existing borders. Putin, like many Russians, feels that the dissolution, the dissolving of the Soviet Union was a horrific thing because it made the Russian people and Russia itself smaller and the Americans are celebrating all of this. I think he's dedicated to building it back up. The first time I met him in the spring of 1991, he was the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, working for the mayor whose name was Anatoly Subchuk. Subchuk was this charismatic, Western-leaning guy allied with Boris Yeltsin. His deputy was the exact opposite of that. Nondescript, gray bureaucrat, a very soft-spoken. Had you asked me back then to name a 1,000 people that might be the next president of Russia, he would not have made my list. He supported Mayor Subcheck, but he was also organizing this incredible network of former KGB, foreign economic interests, and local interests. In the 1990s, St. Petersburg was known for organized crime and corruption. State institutions were partnering with criminal organizations to rip off as much as they could, as fast as they could. Putin was a pretty good fixer. He could make stuff happen. He knew how to work the system. 
Mr. Putin was able, as deputy mayor, to be the focal point of all of these different networks as they came together. He was made FSB director. The FSB is responsible for internal spying. These are the guys who have the most funding, the most resources. He learned, which served him in good stead, how to maneuver politically. That became his primary goal, power. The FSB was simply a ladder. Almost immediately after the breakup of the Soviet Union, these oligarchs were able to take over state-owned enterprises at bargain basement prices, turn some of these individuals into multimillionaires or even billionaires almost overnight. Under Yeltsin, the oligarchs became very powerful and very independent, and the power of the state was crumbling. At the end of the Yeltsin years, he obtained almost sort of a buffoonish uh, type of personality, uh, you know, a drunk, uh, a little bit out of control. Yeltsin was nervous, and he chose to go with a guy that he thought would protect his family and their assets. That's, I think, the sole purpose why Putin was selected to then run for president. Followed by the bombings of the apartment houses. There were a series of terrorist attacks in 1999. They found evidence of the FSB having been there and set that all up. I know what uh, has been alleged. I find the evidence compelling. And I know those terrorist attacks helped Vladimir Putin win the election. I'm not ready to believe yet, and maybe that's just my idealism getting in the way of my analytic side, that the Russian government would kill its own civilians to elect Putin president. The apartment bombings were KGB operations using a type of uh, explosive that was only made in a KGB uh, facility. Oh, sure. They was very clever, and the Russian people began to look for a leader. That's not the first time in history. You could compare it to some degree to the 1930s and the rise of Adolf Hitler. With respect to democracy, I think he was pretty clear from the very get-go. He feared independent actors. Putin started forcing the independent media to knuckle under, putting in state control, turning it into propaganda outfits. The West is not money. He started arresting people who had different points of view. Then he starts going after independent journalists. They start ending up dead, assassinated. The most prominent journalist in Russia, Anna Politkovskaya, was murdered on Putin's birthday. Putin brought the oligarchs to heel. A number of them were forced to leave the country. Some were killed in mysterious fashions. Those who remained are basically lapdogs of his. Putin was letting everyone know that this period of everybody getting to do their own thing was very much over. And then he dropped his most trusted friends and confidants from the intelligence services into the key positions controlling all those businesses. Vladimir Putin and his oligarchs use money essentially stolen from the Russian people. If you're one of these big kleptocrats, getting your stolen proceeds into a rule of law system is one of your highest priorities. Once that money is, is laundered, they have access to Western banks and they can do whatever they want. Semyon Mogilevich was the first big organized crime figure in Russia who figured out how to launder massive amounts out of Russia and the former Soviet Union. 
The Simeon Mogilevich is worth about $10 billion, according to FBI reports. He's considered the money laundering genius. He's sometimes called the brainy Don because he has an economics degree. The most important of the Russian crime bosses, a man who was for years on the 10 most wanted list in the United States. He still lives happily in Moscow today. In Russia, he still gets the VIP treatment and is rarely without a bodyguard who chauffeurs him in his 200,000-pound armor-plated bomb-proof limousine. Why did you set up companies in the Channel Islands? The problem was that I didn't know any other islands. When they taught us geography at school, I was sick that day. The Russian mafia is an adjunct of the Russian government. I've described it as going from organized crime under the Soviets to disorganized crime under Yeltsin, to organized crime again under Putin. Those networks recycle back to Mr. Putin's inner circle, and they continue to help maintain Mr. Putin's power. To the point where today, Putin may well be the wealthiest man on the face of the planet. How does Russia launder money into America? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, everything I know that's interesting, I can't tell you. Um, now, let me try to think of a, a way to go at 30,000 feet. Yeah, I know where you're going with this, because I know we're going to talk about Trump in a few minutes. in the 70s. Donald Trump is a scion of one of the biggest landowners along the East Coast. He played Monopoly. Yes, indeed. More than Monopoly, he played with building blocks. Always with building blocks. He has huge ambitions, huge ego, as we know. It's not everybody is meant to be a business person. They'll ruin their lives. I mean, they'll go and they'll They'll put up their house and they'll mortgage their cars and everything else they own. And he is starting to move into Manhattan. Trump Tower was structured in a way that made it a money laundering paradise. Trump Tower became one of the first buildings in New York where shell companies could buy and sell condos without identifying yourself. If you go back to the 80s, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson got a bill through Congress allowing the immigration of Soviet Jews to the United States at a time when immigration had been highly restricted. We'll honor the right of a person to leave a country freely and return freely, just as clear as anything can be. The Russians saw it as an opportunity to open their jails. That's when you see members of Russian organized crime come to the United States for the very, very first time and end up in Brighton Beach. There were certain techniques for money management and money movement that were prized above others. And these involved real estate. It started off simply as money laundering, pure as simple. And you had in 1984, for example, David Bogadin, who was a Russian mobster, met with Trump. Trump Tower had just opened the previous year. And Bogadin, who had no legal way of making that money, sat down with Trump and bought five condos. And the state attorney general ruled that that was money laundering. Vyacheslav Ivankov who was very close to the great mastermind of organized crime, Semyon Mogilevich, and he was sent to the United States to oversee the rise of the Bride and Beast Mafia. And when the feds were looking for him, they looked all over, and they couldn't find him anywhere in Brooklyn. Instead, he was living in Trump Tower. Donald Trump marries Ivana. The Czech secret police takes note of this. The intelligence that they gathered was that Donald Trump was being pressured, not clear by whom, to run for president as early as 1988. They thought that it would be good for Czechoslovakia if this husband of a Czech citizen became the president of the United States. After his successes in New York City, he got into the Atlantic City casino business. 
he goes big, builds the Trump Taj Mahal. Which will be the largest hotel casino in the world, and I think it's gonna be a tremendous success. That turns out to be his, his undoing. In a town where, for the last 10 years, no casino with 60,000 square foot has ever been fully utilized, on what basis would someone build one with 120,000 feet? He was destined to fail. Trump Casino was hit hard for having violated U.S. federal anti-money laundering regulations. It suggests a culture of willful disregard of the law. He basically unravels financially. He also was unraveling personally at the same time. His marriage was falling apart. By that point, he had filed, I believe it was six bankruptcies. He had no way to move forward professionally. He couldn't get a bank loan anywhere. There is a homeless person sitting, um, sitting right outside of Trump Tower. And I remember my father pointing to him and saying, you know, that guy has $8 billion more than me because he was in such extreme debt at that point, you know? The Russians have a particular type of mark whom they go after. They go after somebody who has business resources, perhaps some shady morals, so that they're amenable to the bribery, or perhaps are in a difficult financial situation and either has political connections or aspirations. I've just described Donald Trump. He was the perfect mark for the Russians. The Russians saved him. They rescued him. He would not have gotten back in business without them. I think it's safe to say he couldn't have run for president if he had just been a guy who was $4 billion in debt. When the Russian mafia does something, it's with Putin's permission, and it's serving his interests. Have you ever knowingly done business with what I like to call organized crime? <laughs> Have they ever stopped well, by? I've, I've said... really tried to stay away from them as much as right. possible. Right. Although I must say, I have met on occasion a few of those sure. people. They happen to be very nice people. You just don't want to owe them money. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Don't owe them money. But now... Simeon Mogilevich, he made a decision to make the move on Trump after studying Trump's 2004 bankruptcy filings. Noticing that Trump had lost his credit lines, they felt he would not be in a position to say no. A Russian uh, real estate firm, Bayrock, started leasing space in Trump Tower. Putin needs to keep track of his oligarchs. And one way of keeping tabs is knowing where their money is. Bayrock may well have been a way of doing that. To me, that's a turning point, because what we have here is a very serious intelligence operation, and it is in the belly of the beast. It is in the home of the man who becomes president of the United States, and it was operating there for many, many years. One of the key people putting it together, Felix Sater. A lieutenant in the Mogilevich crime family, very connected into the nexus between the Russian criminal organizations and the Russian national security organizations. He became managing director of Bayrock. He himself had been convicted of two felonies. Slashing a guy's face in a bar. Another was a pump and dump stock scheme. But he ended up cooperating with the feds, and he started providing information on sales of weapons to Al Qaeda. Mogilevich, according to FBI reports, was selling weapons to Al Qaeda. That raises very interesting questions, because I don't think Felix Sater would betray Mogilevich. He famously threatened an investor with electrocuting his testicles. Trump worked with Sater for many, many years after it was revealed that he was a criminal. He continued to work for Trump and, in fact, had a business card saying that he was a senior advisor to the Trump Organization. There's multiple photographs of the two of them together. He had an office in Trump Tower. Trump was the public face of Bayrock. And yet when he was placed under oath in a deposition and confronted about Sater, he simply says, uh, If he were sitting in the room right now, I, I really wouldn't know what he looked like. Mm -hmm. 
Trump actually personally asked Sater to escort his two children, Ivanka and Donald Trump Jr., on a trip to Moscow and showed them around the town. He seems to be playing a consistent role in assisting the Trumps in tapping Russian or, let's say, post-Soviet money for developing condominium units. No co-op board has to review whoever is buying. It's safer than putting it in a bank. The Sunny Isles development is the Florida development that the Trumps own that has been heavily populated by Russians who want to launder their money. At least a third of the condos in Sunny Isles, Florida, have been sold to Russia. Trump Soho is one of the promoters of the project. Alexander Mashkevich has been described as Mogilevich's banker. Trump Tower project in Baku is located in the middle of a post-industrial sledge pool. It's just sort of a joke that they were building this. Trump World Tower, I started looking at who bought into it, and the very first name I came across that was Russian was that of Eduard Nektolov. He had been indicted for money laundering. He turned state's evidence and was going to cooperate with the feds. He was murdered the next day. The Toronto Tower, the source of funding was a Vinish Economa and Vinish Torg Bank, the two twin cash management tools of the Kremlin. They go out and become involved in projects, usually because one man, Vladimir Putin, tells them to do so. But that would link this project straight back to the Kremlin. I think this is the tip of the iceberg. There's been $1.3 trillion in flight capital since Putin's become president. There are over 30 Trump Towers all over the world. That means there are several thousand units. So many condos that journalists like me have been unable to investigate because they are in shell companies. Shell corporations, where law enforcement and the public and the press can go and see what the name of the corporation is, but they can't find out who's really behind it, what's really going on, who's pulling the strings here. So a $5 million condo could change hands three or four times a year, and you've laundered $20 million or so. We want to follow the money. It's clear to me that a huge amount of it comes from the Ukraine-Russian energy trade. Vladimir Putin particularly has a strong feeling about Ukraine. Ukraine was part of Russia for many, many years. He feels that that needs to be restored. Putin has worked to undermine democracies across the globe. You had a couple of people running for president. Viktor Yanukovych, who appeared to be more interested in keeping Ukraine aligned with Russia. Significant amounts of money coming from Russia into the Yanukovych campaign. His competitor on the other side, Yushchenko, was a Ukrainian politician, a reputation uh, of being clean and fair and pro-Western. Yulia Tymoshenko entered the Yushchenko campaign. She was a politician. Tymoshenko, in my experience, she was by far the most effective minister in the Ukrainian cabinet. Well, I was working for Senator McCain in uh, 2004, and we visited, and we met with Yushchenko. They just said, I'm afraid they're going to try to kill him. Within a matter of months, he had been poisoned and almost was killed. A disfiguring poisoning. It destroyed his looks, scarred his face. Quite convinced that it was a KGB operation. He was off the campaign trail for about four weeks. It also had a second effect, too, was it really hardened his resolve. We want to be a democratic country. Uh, we want uh, to live in market economy and not in the Soviet Union Republic. During the election, there was lots of evidence that something had gone wrong. At that time, Ukrainian intelligence agencies detected that there were hackers who were actually trying to break into the Central Election Commission. So they were trying to change the results of the votes. 
In those parts that had voted for Yanukovych, turnout in excess of 100% was reported. The country's election commission ignored reports of fraud, declaring Kremlin-backed Viktor Yanukovych the winner. The election was, in the eyes of most Ukrainians, stolen. The Ukrainians had enough, and the Orange Revolution consisted of people coming out to the central Kyiv square and saying, no, we're not going to accept a bad election. The Ukrainian Supreme Court basically ruled a do-over. Russia opposed that idea because they understood correctly that if it was done in a free and fair way that Mr. Yanukovych would not win. And Yushchenko became president. His prime minister was Yulia Tymoshenko. So this week has a unique feel to it as we all have the profound privilege of welcoming President Viktor Yushchenko to the United States. Protection from the regime of mobsters is only better than cause of your own. So we faced a very simple choice, and it was not uh, a choice between the left and the right. It was the choice between the totalitarian regime and democracy. The choice between the future and the past. Viktor Yanukovych predicted more turmoil ahead. I am ready to lead, he said. Yushchenko will find out what opposition really means. Mr. Manafort came to Ukraine late 2004. Yanukovych had been fairly badly discredited. The role that I saw for Mr. Manafort was somebody try to rehabilitate uh, Mr. Yanukovych. Paul Manafort has been a Washington political consultant for a long, long time. Paul Manafort, a top campaign strategist for President Bush. I will stipulate for purposes of today that you, know, you could characterize this as influence. Bill. Bob Dole was the last one who brought him on as the head of the convention at that point. We are ready not only to continue to lead in the Congress, but to take the White House. He had disappeared. Like, no one knew what he was doing. It's impossible that Paul Manafort was not at least run past the Russian government uh, because Manafort was very close to Yanukovych and Yanukovych was so close to the Kremlin. The big switch from Western, the Western point of view, was the Munich Security Conference speech. The United States has overstepped its national borders in every way. Of course, such a policy stimulates an arms race. No one feels safe. Senator Joe Lieberman and I were sitting in the sign seats in the front row, and he would utter a phrase in Russian, and then after he would say it, he'd look over at the two of us like that, you know. I said, what, the, what is it with this guy? I very often hear appeals by our partners to the effect that Russia should play an increasingly active role in world affairs. That was 2007. Two months later, they did the cyber attack on my country because we really didn't want a Soviet statue in the middle of town. We didn't tear it down, we moved it. We figured, okay, this is important for some people, but even that was uh, sort of enough of an offense. <laughs> On the 9th of May, the day the Russians celebrate the end of World War II, no one could get into any websites, including the banks, any government sites, news media. I mean, it's clear they did it. A year later, they invaded Georgia. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia was controlled by mafias and criminal gangs that were known as thieves in law. Then it came the revolution and Misha Saakashvili became their president. He made really very significant changes and improvements to the country. 
after years of the Georgian economy being a basket case, it suddenly starts to roar. He had a vision of Georgia in NATO and the EU. The Russians hated him. As long as you have these blocks, NATO and the European Union, they're bigger, richer, stronger, more powerful than Russia. But if you reduce them to their individual parts, each of these countries is far weaker than Russia. They kept provoking the Georgians more and more and more and more. They wanted a war. He started to say there will be war. First, he started to tell it to me, uh, to some Western leaders. It looked like the West was wandering blindfolded somewhere, and the Russians knew where they were going. Then we had direct military attacks. In the middle of the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, the Russians invaded Georgia. Wake up, wake up. We are attacked because we wanted to be free. We are attacked because we wanted to build genuine democracy. If Americans and Europeans don't stand up for their own values, for their own principles, then those principles and values will be in danger today in Georgia, tomorrow, elsewhere. But the Russians then spent a lot of time convincing everyone the Georgians started the war. It was Saakashvili's fault. He was dangerous and a madman. Russia has criticized the Western media for what it's called its biased view on the conflict. Not all journalists blame Russia for the conflict. Alex James. I just hope Russia keeps troops in Georgia because the dictator, and he, we know he was elected under fraud there in Georgia, has said that he plans, he said it last week, to attack again. Allegation that Georgia would attack Russia is, is, a, is, is so foolish and outrageous and disgraceful, but it's typical of Vladimir Putin. They did not achieve the collapse of the Saakashvili government. It cost them a lot in respect, in international relationships, and their military was really exposed as something weaker than they all thought. So there was this whole portfolio of kind of rethinking what are the political warfare tools that we have that we can use. They began to increase their funding to far-right, nationalistic, white supremacist political parties. In democracies, Public opinion is your battlefield. It's finding those affinity groups. They don't like globalization. They're very fearful of immigration. They're xenophobic. That fear is then used by Russian disinformation operations to say, you're not being protected from migration crisis, from the social changes that we see around you. Gazprom and others, they were purchasing local affiliates, so it looked less Russian, had less of a Russian face. Gazprom is the world's largest gas company. It and its resources are used to help uh, achieve the political objectives of the Russian state. When the economics and the politics combined, in fact, the, the, its state capture, the, the national government cannot take independent action uh, that that does not follow Russia's policy interests. It's far better to expend your energy on getting a Russia-friendly government elected than it is to have to build up your military to invade the country. There was no Russian oligarch, Ivan Shvili, who was the biggest private shareholder of Russian Gazprom. Suddenly, Ivan Shvili announced that he's entering politics and he will run against us. They wanted to believe that he was this independent, weirdo businessman. He must be a very successful man. Nobody wanted to believe he was what he is, a front for Russian engagement in the country. The campaign in Georgia before the 2012 election had been increasingly dirty and hostile and violent. So the narrative was that no matter what, we would falsify, rig the elections, and then they would take it to the streets. There's a lot of discussion about political prosecution. If they won, they would have put the entire former government in prison. These were all criminals. Some of it was really cheap stuff. Saakashvili is really an Armenian. He's not really a Georgian. That's a technique the Russians use quite a bit. The best way to discredit somebody is to make them appear inauthentic. They're not part of the community, which they say they are. Then it's picked up by other media. It's sort of spread around social media. Eventually, people sort of say, some of this must be true. Mafia bosses, fifth son-in-law from Russia, 
try to help to organize mass disturbances. They listened to our telephone conversation, especially when we were calling from abroad. So whenever some situation would ignite in Georgia, they always had intercepts for all kinds of situations. No party in Georgia could have been, in a real popular way, pro-Russian, and Ivanishvili really knew that. So you had a new message on Russia. It was, wouldn't it be nice if we had a better relationship with Russia? <laughs> And about two weeks before the vote, there was the release of the first of what became known as the prison abuse tapes. The images looked very bad. After the initial shock, people started to look at the image. In details, they explained to us that the whole thing was fake. Later, we discovered that this thing was done by guys with very well-known Russian intelligence connections, but it was too late. On Tuesday, President Saakashvili conceded he'd lost the closely fought parliamentary vote. 65 or so former officials have been arrested, detained, or convicted. Saakashvili will be arrested if he goes back to Georgia. And then you saw the allowing of Russian money back into Georgian civil society. We are returning Georgian products to the Russian market. His wealth and his fortune are all connected to the Kremlin. That means he can never be independent of what they want. Putin had told their National Security Council that Georgian elections were the most successful special operation they've ever had. They learned that any democratic system is essentially very vulnerable to this kind of meddling. Through corruption, informational campaigns, character destructions, and then your adversary is much more vulnerable. That it's not about their economy size or military size. It's about their state of mind. In Ukraine, Putin did the same thing. Ukraine is about 100% dependent on Russia for natural gas. Instead of there being direct sales from Gazprom, there were a whole series of intermediary companies, which seemed to be controlled by a man named Dmitry Firtash. Dmitry Firtash, a pro-Putin oligarch, he has worked with Mogilevich, the crime boss. They siphon off lots of money from this gas trade, billions of dollars. Firtash was very close to Vladimir Putin. Paul Manafort was a business partner of Firtash. Ukrainian politicians, it would all just whisper the name Paul Manafort. He was the dark prince in the background, orchestrating everything. He was viewed as a man who was the connection between the Kremlin and pro-Russian party in Ukraine to advance Russian political interests. Russia was buying up utilities. The oligarchs were doing Putin's bidding. It cut off Ukraine's energy supply. It's really a terrible thing if someone is killed by a bullet. But isn't it terrible if you shut down the, the power in the winter? In 2009, after about two weeks meeting with President Putin, Prime Minister Tymoshenko negotiated a deal uh, that ended the gas cutoff. The presidential elections head for a pulsating climax. In the orange corner, the current pro-Western Prime Minister, Yulia Tymoshenko. In the blue corner, pro-Moscow opposition leader, Viktor Yanukovych, Manafort was remaking Yanukovych's overall appearance and personality as a politician to make him more palatable. When he said no to a TV debate, she went ahead with it anyway, facing an empty podium. Viktor Yanukovych claimed victory in the Ukraine presidential election. Once Viktor Yanukovych had become president, one of the things they were trying to go after Tymoshenko for was, in fact, that gas arrangement that she'd done. She compared the case to a Stalinist show trial. 
All this was staged in advance at the president's administration to eliminate the opposition. She may have done a bad deal, but it certainly wasn't uh, the criminal action that the Ukrainian government under Yanukovych charged her with. A seven-year prison term and an order that she pay $200 million in compensation. Prison to Mashinko staged a temporary hunger strike, saying she'd been beaten by guards and needed better medical attention. In the lawsuit that was filed by the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, there were some rather striking court documents referring to Manafort's role. Uh, and including his business relationships, real estate deals with a Russian oligarch, Dmitry Firtash. Paul Manafort was in business with not one, but two Russian oligarchs. Dmitry Firtash, who was under indictment by the US Justice Department. Another. Deripaska, who had been denied entry to the United States because of suspected organized crime ties. Paul Manafort signed a contract with Oleg Deripaska to promote the Kremlin and the Kremlin's interests. Quoting Deripaska, Putin told him, Manafort's our man. Paul Manafort got his home in Trump Towers in 2006. You can easily see billions of dollars being siphoned off from that Ukraine-Russian energy trade and it going through Firtash to Paul Manafort and to Russians or Ukrainians who are buying condos and Trump-branded properties. Russia has three main tactics for engaging what we call active measures. Propaganda, cyber attacks. Most people don't focus on a third pillar of Russian active measures, which is to recruit and enlist, and in some cases run, agents of influence. The Russians, with their full-time intelligence operatives, there's probably way over a 1,000 of those in the United States. The FBI does its best to try to monitor Russian intelligence officers here in the United States. But there are so many of them, and frankly, the FBI's resources are so limited. When I did cases, I actually had to decide on which days I wanted the FBI surveillance group to watch my target. We had no idea. They just seemed like a nice, just quiet so family. If you look at either as Russian agents or as Russians who work on disinformation, there are more of them than there are Russians in the armed forces. So, a thousand? <laughs> These can be individuals who know that they are spying for Russian intelligence, know that they are committing espionage, or can refer to some individuals who just aren't sure exactly who they're dealing with. Maybe it's bankers, maybe it's uh, financiers, maybe it's people on the periphery of government, doing something that the Russian government wants. It seems that anybody who was anybody in Russian organized crime who came to Manhattan bought a condo unit at Trump Tower. There were gambling operations going on there and prostitution operations. These investigations were leading to Trump over and over and over again. Christopher Steele is a former MI6 specialist in Russia. The U.S. investigative firm commissioned Mr. Steele to look at Mr. Trump and Russia. It was a very general assignment, and he found an extensive set of relations with Russia. He was generally held in very high regard. He had a reputation, of course, also for working with the FBI. He helped the FBI make the FIFA cases. 
Major corruption crackdown going down right now. Arrests made around the world. This is the result of a three-year-long FBI investigation. He broke the case uh, and gave them access to uh, the key witnesses uh, that they used to get the pretty spectacular results that they ultimately got. Alexander Litvinenko, who's a former FSB agent, and when he sought asylum in London, he started working for MI6. His handler was Christopher Steele. He was trying to expose that Vladimir Putin was closely linked to Simeon Mogilevich, the crime boss of Russia. Litvinenko was eventually poisoned by polonium in a murder that was very directly linked to Russia. So when Christopher Steele was hired to do oppo research on Donald Trump, he was very, very knowledgeable indeed. The Steele dossier was a set of reports that Mr. Steele wrote. All of its allegations uh, fall into one of three categories. Not yet proven. proven to be true and have an error that is consistent with transcription or transliteration problems. It was said to Mr. Steele's sources that Russia had churned Mr. Trump for many, many years. In the course of work on Russia matters, I came to know Mr. Steele. I work with people who I can trust. Yes, I trusted Chris Steele. I still trust Chris Steele. Look at Putin, what he's doing with, I mean, you know, what's going on over there. I mean, this guy has done, whether you like him or don't like him, he's doing a great job in rebuilding the image of Russia and also rebuilding Russia, period. Putin seeks the veneer of democratic legitimacy, but there cannot be choice. In the Russian Constitution, you cannot run for a third term as president. So what he did was to find a very close member of his inner circle to agree to be president while he could be prime minister. He is someone who is obviously being installed by Putin, and it raises serious issues about uh, uh, how we're going to deal with Russia going forward. Putin faces what I call the King Lear problem. You can't resign to a comfortable life because of the things you've done when you were king. But the constitutional forms were observed. Разные люди склонны западать на разные вещи. Говорят, что самая большая зависимость от власти. When Putin returned to the presidency, by that point, I think it was about the least surprising development that any of us have seen in Russia in a long time. I mean, you can imagine the conversation with Putin. Vladimir, you think you'd like to be president again? I think I've heard that. <laughs> The election was clearly unfair, uh, illegitimate. I said that on behalf of the United States. We've just witnessed a flawed Duma election in Russia, including efforts to halt the election monitoring. And Russian voters deserve a full investigation of electoral fraud and manipulation. I wasn't the only person who thought that. He encountered the largest public demonstrations of his tenure. They shouted, Putin is a thief which terrified him because of the Orange Revolution. Because of the uprisings that took place post-collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in places that wanted more than just a different form of autocracy. If you look at the crowds of those that were in the protest, I'll bet you nine out of 10 of them were under age 25. They don't want that kind of a government. They want to be like the Europeans. And I think that Vladimir Putin has not seen the last of these protests. And then he attacked me and accused me of inciting the demonstrations that really were grassroots from the bottom up. Putin blamed her uh, very publicly. Uh, privately, he did too, by the way. She set the tone for some of the activists inside our country, gave them a signal. They heard this signal and started active work with support of the US State Department. I suspect that Putin 
like Stalin, read everyone else by his own measure. And being a cynical person, understanding only power, he probably assumed that we were equally cynical and our protestations of support for democracy were meaningless fluff. So that he sees our actions in Russia as designed to undermine him. And he looks at all the democratic activists as somehow somebody else's puppet. Hillary Clinton is doing this, or Condi Rice is doing this. It's not that he believes everything, but there is a, a kind of a grounding in his KGB training. Because you remember, during the Cold War, they would fund some firebrand in some country to uh, become allied with them, and we would go in and try to undercut that person, and vice versa. But a lot of it is just to keep people in Russia in line. My experience with him was difficult and challenging because I challenged him. It's better not to argue with women, but Mrs. Clinton has never been too graceful in her statements. When people push boundaries too far, it's not because they are strong, but because they are weak. But maybe weakness is not the worst quality for a woman. In meetings that I've had with him, he is in a very calculated way of trying to gain advantage, looking at you with disdain and contempt. The bored kid in school, when the cameras are on, he will criticize the United States. When the cameras are gone, he'll act like he's willing to talk to you. He's in demand spreading, you know what that is, right? Putin never really developed a working relationship with uh, Secretary Clinton. He became very upset about what she said in December 2011 and was looking for revenge. If you can use and capture elite in specific ways, you can accomplish your goals without needing to get public support. The recruiting tool was money. You see just so much money flowing to Trump. It's hard to imagine. There's not more to it than just simple generosity. <laughs> All his American banks cut their lines of credit, stopped doing business with him, and one bank steps into the breach uh, as his lender of choice, and that's Deutsche Bank. From the perspective of most Western bankers, that was just seen as insane. He's had a history of making misleading statements to them, threatening them. They call a loan, he sues them. He fails to pay the loan. He publicly criticizes Deutsche Bank about all this. But Deutsche Bank sticks with him loyally throughout. Not only that, they also start making loans to his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Deutsche Bank has been fined before for participating in Russian money laundering. The German bank says it's willing to pay over $600 million in fines for its connections to alleged Russian money laundering. When the scandal erupted at Deutsche Bank about these money laundering operations, the Deutsche Bank CEO was fired. He became the CEO of the Bank of Cyprus. One of the financial institutions through which they launder money. Who hired him to be the CEO of the Bank of Cyprus? Wilbur Ross, tight supporter of Donald Trump, now his Secretary of Commerce. The practice of overpaying significantly uh, is something that uh, falls into the category of Russian methods. The man known as the Russian Potash King, Lubyovyev, purchases a property for more than twice what Trump had paid for it. That's when our country was going through a financial collapse that largely was caused by the real estate market. Did he overpay uh, because Mr. Trump was such a great negotiator, or was there something else going on? Never does anything with the property. So the property transaction appears to be nothing more than cover for infusing a cool $100 million into Trump's bank accounts. This same Rublyovyev is uh, also a principal owner with Wilbur Ross of the Bank of Cyprus. In 2013, there was a bust in Trump Tower of a massive gambling ring. And it was run by a guy named Taiwan Chick. And he has been tied to the Russian crime boss, Simeon Mogilevich. 29 people were indicted, but Taiwan Chick fled to Russia. 
Taiwan Chick appeared again that year, oddly enough, at the Miss Universe pageant that Donald Trump was doing with Aras Agalarov. Billionaire oligarch who was known actually as Putin's builder because he had done massive construction projects for the Kremlin and gotten a big award personally delivered by Putin. Donald Trump chose Moscow as the place to have Miss Universe. I think it would be important for us to understand just who he met with while he was on that trip, whether he talked to uh, Vladimir Putin. There was a luncheon with a lot of Russian business leaders in which Trump spoke, and the birthday party for Aris Agalarov. He even appears in the Scion of the Algorov family's music video. You're fired. Compromot, it's essentially embarrassing information that's going to put you under somebody else's thumb. Use money, use sex, use whatever they can to try to entrap people. I mean, that's just a fact. They don't mind blowing up their own bribery scheme to blackmail an individual. And now they've got that person. There's certainly rumors that uh, on his trips to Moscow that Trump was involved in various sex escapades and that may have compromised him. I could offer you a check for ten million dollars. Million. But the deal is you can't you can't have sex for the next ten years. What well, would that include my wife? This would be my form of alcohol. And Sergei Milian appears in connection with Trump's dealings in Russia and uh, certainly in connection with his hotel stays. Someone who would know an awful lot about what went on during those visits, in meetings with prostitutes and so forth. You know, I was in Moscow a couple of months ago. I owned the Miss Universe pageant. And they treated me so great. Putin even sent me a present, beautiful present with a beautiful note. When you look at Steele's report, the information he gives, one of those sources could be Milian. We don't know that for sure, but the descriptions match. He likes Russia because there's money to be made there. He likes Russia because uh, he likes beautiful Russian ladies. <laughs> but I, I hear that Golden Towers was not the end of it. There was much more extreme, sick stuff. He was only there two days, one night. He was supposed to be there longer, but Billy Graham's 95th birthday party was in Asheville, North Carolina. Trump felt the need to go. Why? Because he's getting ready to run for president. Happy birthday to you. To be honest, the question was just asked, and was asked many times today at the Miss Universe contest. They're saying, would you run? And it's just too soon to say. Do you have a relationship with Vladimir Putin, a conversational relationship, or anything that you feel you have sway or influence over his government? I do have a relationship, and I can tell you that he's very interested in what we're doing here today. He's probably very interested in what you and I are saying today, and I'm sure he's going to be seeing it in some form, but I do have a relationship with him. About Russia, you were asked yesterday if you've ever spoken to Vladimir Putin, and you said, I don't want to say. Yeah, I have no comment on that. No comment. I was but in Russia. But one of the people, things people like about you is to yeah, but answer I, I any question. Because if, it, it, let's assume I did, perhaps it was personal. Or, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt his confidence. He's done a very brilliant job in terms of what he represents and who he's representing. Viktor Yanukovych had been in talks with the European Union about an association agreement. But then after a visit to Moscow, and getting the message that this was not going to be seen favorably, Yanukovych came back and decided that, in fact, he was not going to pursue this agreement. So this square in, in downtown Kiev, protesters went there and began demanding that, in fact, this agreement go into force instead of some alternative agreement with Russia. 
a protest not just in favor of an agreement with the European Union, but a protest against Viktor Yanukovych and the way he was running Ukraine at the time. About a week later, the police went in and broke up that camp. In two hours, shed more blood than it had been shed during the entire Orange Revolution back in 2004. And at each turn, Yanukovych became more and more repressive, more and more bloodthirsty. You had people shooting into the crowd, in some cases, directly shot to the head where it looked like snipers were shooting at them. Probably 100 you know, odd people killed. He just infuriated and enraged his entire country. Yanukovych defied calls for his resignation. I am not going to leave Ukraine or go anywhere. Yanukovych packed up in a car and left. He fled the country and turned up in Russia. And this is while Manafort is still advising him. Uh, I don't think that Yanukovych was the pro-Putin person that, that he's reputed to be. And if you look at what... Well, he uh, went up, he ended up in Moscow. It, well, yeah. The ousted president is wanted for mass murder and on the run. So you have the Ukrainian parliament. What do we do? Parliament voted to free Yanukovych's arch nemesis, opposition leader Yulia Tymoshenko. Today, you have an open road to build Ukraine the way you want. That is why you must stay here until the person you trust is elected in an honest way. My sense is at that point, the Russians panicked. The Russians had lying in a safe somewhere the plan, how you take Crimea, and they activated that plan. Within a couple of days, you saw people who were very clearly professional soldiers. They were wearing Russian-style combat fatigues, but they had no identifying insignia. The Ukrainians referred to these people as little green men. Which were, in fact, special operations forces and intelligence operatives. We thought this could be the beginning of an outright, full-scale invasion of the country. That's when the separatists shot down the Malaysian airliner and killed over 100 Dutch passengers. Separatists initially boasted on Twitter that they had taken it down. The unforgivable sin was Putin lying about it, suggesting the Ukrainians shot it down or CIA shot it down, throwing out a bunch of chaff, which was an insult. The European Union had had enough. They joined us with strong sectoral sanctions. That surprised the Russians, and it hit the Russian economy hard. Right at the time, oil prices started to tank. So they had a double whammy. How do you respond to the greatest geostrategic catastrophe of the 20th century, which was the collapse of the Soviet Union? You try to preempt the collapse of the Western system in the 21st century. If you can't destroy these structures militarily, you will destroy them from within. By actually creating fissures and exploiting them such that it's the electorate is so divided that you don't trust the government anymore. The foundations of geopolitics is a guiding principle for Russia. And it's something that their militaries and intelligence services have relied upon and applied uh, throughout their campaigns. Russia has helped unite an alternative right movement. You have certain voices in the media, Infowars, for example, Breitbart, that capitalize on these divisions and then further encourage them for their own personal gain. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Knock the crap out of him, would you? Seriously. You gotta look like an NFL football player. No, they took him out. And I'll tell you what, it was, it was really amazing to watch. Bye, go home to mommy. But if we get a little bit rough in taking them out, oh, we're terrible people. 
It's one of the many reasons our country's going to hell. Certainly, this is all in the interest of at least uh, one country. To see this otherwise rather brazen candidate turn into such a sycophant when the name of Putin ever came up rang a very discordant bell. Putin has done a, an amazing job of showing leadership, whether it's a noble cause or not. Let's not discuss that. He is now the world leader. I respect Putin. He's a strong leader, I can tell you that. Unlike what we have, we have a pathetic leader. I think in terms of leadership, he's getting an A. As far as an individual who poses a threat to the world, literally, a person who has no moral standards that I've been able to detect, F is not low enough. He was certainly very vocal about Russia wanting a better relationship. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing, frankly, if we actually got along with Russia? Who's against getting along with people? But that's not a policy. More noticeable, perhaps, is the absence of any criticism. The fact is that, uh, you know, he hasn't been convicted of anything. Some of the things he was saying were actually talking points uh, that sounded very similar to what the Russian media would put out there. The fact that Ukraine has not published radar data leads us to the conjecture the missile, if it was a book, was launched from territory under the control of the Ukrainian military. It was a Russian-made book missile that took down that plane. Would you hold Putin and Russia accountable? Would there be sanctions? Well, you know, they say it wasn't them. It may have been their weapon, but they didn't use it. They didn't fire it. They even said the other side fired it to blame them. He never provided his original birth certificate. What he provided was a photoshopped, computer image of something that was issued only in 2007. A certificate of live birth is not even signed by anybody. I saw his. I read it very carefully. They're voting for peace on planet Earth if they vote for Trump. But if they vote for Hillary, it's war. Now Hillary Clinton wants to confront nuclear-armed Russia. That could very well lead us into World War III. Mr. McCain was taken prisoner in Vietnam and was put not just in jail, but in a pit. He sat there for several years. Anyone would go nuts after that. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, OK? I hate to tell you. Donald Trump delivered a major foreign policy speech at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington on April 27th. The Center for the National Interest, this American think tank, which has very close ties to the Kremlin. This think tank played a leading role in drafting Donald Trump's speech, and that speech was full of Russian propaganda. We can upgrade NATO's outdated mission and structure grown out of the Cold War. I am skeptical of international unions. The U.S. must be prepared to let these countries defend themselves. Some say the Russians won't be reasonable. I intend to find out. When Paul Manafort became the actual head of the campaign, all of a sudden I had a pop-up window come on my computer saying that Yahoo believed that I was part of an attempt of state-sponsored actors. So I was being targeted. That was the first time. There was a Russian campaign to interfere in American elections through hacking. That information appeared in the dossier before it was publicly reported anywhere else, anywhere. You saw active measures in elections across Eastern Europe. No one really thought that that would happen in the US space uh, until it did. I was surprised, as everyone was. But looking back on it, with the benefit of hindsight, obviously, we should have probably known that something like that was going to happen. Russia is 1.6% of world economy. They're so small, but, they're, but they have, they're so centralized. And when a state concentrates its resources on wanting something, then it works. Russia did a wide range of hacks. Started, I would guess, around August, September of 2015, and extended all the way through the spring and into the summer of 2016. And we're talking about thousands of Americans that were hit. They were going after anybody and everybody they could. Their targets include media personalities, politicians, government officials, current and former, anybody that they can gain what is ultimately information or compromise that they can use 
That is the nuclear fuel that powers the influence operation in 16. A couple of my uh, co-workers who had access to my personal email, just to manage the volume, one of them saw a phishing uh, attempt from a Google source through some mistake of communication. One of our cybersecurity experts in the campaign suggested uh, to my assistant that they change the email account. So she clicked on the link and my private email cache was, you know, was, was, was exfiltrated. People were seeing this dangerous, troubling activity coming from the Russians that was actually in our electoral system. Government officials learn that they're actually going into state voter databases. There may have been 26 different states where there were efforts made to penetrate. That's disturbing. The key to the flip an election without leaving a trace is the voter rolls. It would only take a small digital switch to make that happen. This really spooked officials in the White House. And that's the moment, I think, that the enormity of the Russian influence campaign really started to hit home. The fact that there was an, that attack on the fundamental, the absolute fundamental of free and fair election, uh, should alarm all of us. The Russians didn't care if we found out. This is pretty new. They stole the data. Let's be clear about it. I don't like this word hacking. This is theft. If the Russians walked into my house and took something out, this is exactly the same thing. And I think the problem that a lot of Americans have with it is that they don't see it, they don't think of it that way. The goal was plausible deniability. And you'll hear that even in Vladimir Putin's statements. If they are patriotic, they contribute in a way they think is right to fight against those who say bad things about Russia. If there were, People in the Trump campaign who colluded in any of that, those people are at serious criminal risk because there were serious crimes people committed in 2016 to influence the U.S. elections. Once it looked like Trump was going to be the clear nominee, the Alagrovs resurfaced and they said, we are obviously supportive of the Trump campaign, but more importantly, we are doing so with the blessing of the Russian government and with Russian government involvement. And they promised there would be the delivery of information that would damage Hillary Clinton's campaign. This is information the Russian government has collected. Donald Trump Jr. emailed back, great, I love it. Here we see what appears to be evidence of collusion. Donald Trump Jr. forwarded the emails to Paul Manafort, then the campaign manager, and Jared Kushner. They both sat in on the meeting. Conspiracies are very easy to enter into if indeed uh, there was just a tacit agreement furthering that conspiracy. Boy, they're in, uh, and they, they're on the wrong side of the law. Trump being pressed um, uh, early on in the campaign for a list of his foreign policy advisors. And the second name he mentions is Carter Page, PhD. No one had heard of Carter Page. He had worked for Merrill Lynch in Moscow. He had been an investor in Gazprom and a quite vocal defender of the Putin government, uh, a critic of sanctions. Carter Page? traveled over to Moscow with permission of the Trump campaign as a senior advisor to Donald Trump. Washington and other Western capitals have impeded potential progress through their often hypocritical focus on ideas such as democratization, inequality, corruption, and regime change. The Steele dossier alleges that Carter Page met with Igor Sechin, who is head of Rosneft, the enormous Russian oil company. Sechin happens to be very, very close to Vladimir Putin. Sechin was his closest friend in the intelligence services. They came up with a scheme by which sanctions would be lifted on Russia. In return, when parts of Rosneft were sold off, a huge portion of it, I believe it was 19% of it, would be diverted. This could have been another way to funnel enormous cash resources to Donald Trump or his family. 
America's European allies. We're picking up things involving interaction between figures associated with the Trump campaign and Russian agents of influence that they were very disturbed about. When the administration asked for a bipartisan statement saying the Russians were active and they were trying to interfere with the election, they were blocked by the Republican leadership. When I was working in the House of Representatives, especially as the policy director for the House Republicans, I was part of many discussions. One of them was on June 15th. One of the leaders speculated that Trump had a compromising relationship with Putin. A very serious allegation to make, but it was one that everyone was thinking. The leaders were afraid to stand up to Donald Trump for fear of being attacked by his Russian troll army. By the time of the convention, it was beginning to look like there was a really serious Russian effort. She is above the Michael Flynn had become a top national security advisor to Trump. Lock her up. What concerns me, again, from a counterintelligence perspective, is the pattern that Flynn has established. Flynn goes to Moscow, sits next to Vladimir Putin at a lavish RT-sponsored event. Just like in the United States, you don't get to sit next to the President of the United States without any planning. He takes money from the Russians, from RT, which is nothing more than a propaganda arm of the Kremlin. Then says he didn't take any money. Were you paid for that event? I, you'd have to ask my uh, the folks that, that uh, went over there to. to uh, well, I'm asking you. You you'd know if you were paid. Yeah, I didn't take Sachs. any money from Russia. If you ask, that's what you're asking me. Well, then who paid you? Uh, my my speakers bureau. The speakers bureau is merely the pass through for the organization that's paying for the speech. Flynn had given the same answer when he was trying to get his security clearance. At that convention, the Republican Party did something that they almost have never done before, which was take out of their platform language that was standing up for Ukraine and standing against Russia. I was confident that was going to be part of our party platform. It was before. All of a sudden, somewhere, it disappeared. J.D. Gordon, his account is that it was at the request of the Trump campaign. I think that's part of this whole scandal that needs to be resolved. Why would the Republican Party remove a provision that would help a people who have been invaded and slaughtered defend themselves? Interesting. went into the convention, we had to contend with that first drop of emails. Just that DNC employees... It's Russian actors. Uh, and they were in communication or in touch with Julian Assange at WikiLeaks. And then they published that data in a way to help Trump and hurt Hillary Clinton. When WikiLeaks was originally founded, I don't think it had the intention of influencing the 2016 American election. But was it the goal after Assange announced that he wanted to harm Hillary? You bet. I mean, he said so. From that standpoint, it was a match made in heaven. They were actively in the systems of Democratic, and as we now know, Republicans as well. We'll publish the embarrassing material from the hack into the DNC. We won't publish the embarrassing material in the RNC. There were more damaging ones on Manafort that they could have dropped. They didn't. It really exposed a lot of personal contact information. So many staff were getting harassment and calls for weeks. As we learned more, first about the DNC, he basically invited them to try to, you know, hack into me. He blurts things out. 
that sound to me as a prosecutor almost like an effort to confess. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. If you were, in fact, conspiring with Russia and encouraging them to help your campaign and signaling them as to what you wanted them to do. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. There's a pretty good suggestion right there, but in this case, made in plain view in open daylight at high noon. It's a little odd. The campaign was over. Bernie had lost. I was assisting and helping with a number of Facebook pages here in California. I started to see strange people appearing. Their posts were coming from American sounding websites. But when I peeled away the layers, Eastern Europe became a common theme. They were propaganda pieces. Not a single one of them true. All viciously anti-Hillary. This isn't just one Sanders page. It's Latinos for Sanders. It's Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan for Sanders. It kept on going. While we were focusing on the positive of social media and information technology, Russia was looking at how to use that as an instrument, and they have been incredibly effective. With cyber, with social media, with things like RT, they can reach out to Western publics in a way that they couldn't do 35, 40 years ago. Some of their predecessors would be really envious of the techniques that they have now. How the Russian state does its influence operations online is pretty complex. On the one hand, you have real people, trolls, but a bigger part is actually digital disinformation, making user accounts that are algorithms. This is the evolution of artificial intelligence online. Russians uh, figure out how you game Google. If you have enough bots to drive it to the top of the Google suggestion list. Any wedge that's there, they're gonna test that audience out. And when they find success, then they exploit it. They double down on it. You might see them show up around Black Lives Matter protest and in the counter protest movement any anti-government or white supremacist group, nationalist, not globalist, anti-EU, anti-NATO, anti-immigration. Promoting the far right, promoting the far left, so that our politics become more polarized. Then Putin can feed lies to either side because they hate each other so much. If we're divided as Americans, then it's harder for us to stand up to that influence. They know that in the West, there's a tendency towards positivism. There's a tendency towards, well, I don't know, that's a, that's a story that's out there. We can't just discredit it. You know, we have to, maybe, the, maybe it's right. The, the Russians know that we do this as Westerners. They see it coming, and they take it to the bank every single time. The Westerners are lazy. I mean, they don't do research. Russians have already done everything for them, and they know how to pack it and how to feed it to them. Russia wins the audience first and then directs them somewhere. It's very different from American approaches. Americans are impatient. You just create pictures, you create bios that look like accounts that are from these locations because people are more likely to take in information from people that look like them and talk like them. Follow everybody that's in that community, you retweet what they say, lowering the guard of that audience so they would accept Russian information or Russian views. Over time, begin inserting the content you want. In this office building in St. Petersburg, an army of trolls. They were even caught on camera, secretly filmed by a former employee. The US elections are the key issue for the Kremlin, and of course Russia has invested a lot of effort into them. It's so sophisticated and adapted for the tastes of internet users that it's almost impossible to recognize. You have serious quotas, so in an hour you have to produce 20 tweets, 30 comments on these websites, so it's, it's actually like a work environment for these people. 12 hours a day praising the Kremlin and berating its enemies. I myself have a number of Russian trolls. I know whenever I refer to the illegal annexation of Crimea, I get you know, quite a bit of criticism. An interview like this, once it goes out on the internet, I'll receive some sort of trolling very specifically around it. The goal is essentially to get you to shut up and to not be a challenger. They'll threaten lawsuits, for example, because they know nothing affects an American like the threat of a lawsuit. If you're operating in Europe, the closer you get to Moscow, the more your physical life is actually in danger. 
can try and break into your bank accounts, hack you financially. And if they can't get to you personally, they'll target your family. They create false stories, seed it out there to try and destroy your reputation. If you plant an idea, a fake story, a lie, it will take on a life of its own and you don't have to do the propagating, the audience will do it for you. Seth Rich was a campaign worker for Hillary Clinton. He turned up dead. The Seth Rich story was that he was the one who stole the Democratic Committee emails. There's no evidence to support that. To date, is it's an unsolved murder, but it's propagated both by the alternative right, but also by groups like WikiLeaks, even to the point where you had Russian ambassadors show up and say, ah, I think there might be something to this Seth Rich story. That doubt that's there really covers your hand over the longer term. And sometimes the most outrageous uh, are the ones that you think that you don't want to dignify with a response to, but that I've, I've subsequently learned that's a kind of dangerous proposition. John Podesta said, let's go you know, over to the pizza place, and all of a sudden it's a story about a child trafficking ring in the basement, which doesn't exist, in the pizza place. Resulted in a person who had been reading this stuff deciding that he would deputize himself to come up here with a gun, firing that weapon in the pizza parlor but it just sort of never ends. In 2013, they were starting to learn the power of this influence. In 2014, they were doing capability development. 15 was winning audiences so that in 2016, we could actually go after the US election. The primary message would be, one, Hillary Clinton cannot become president. The second one is Trump is the man to bend fences with Russia, and he's a great leader and a nationalist, much like Putin. The third one was Bernie Sanders got a raw deal, but you shouldn't even come out to the polls. The Russians, in line with right-wing radical media, were creating false stories to generate fear. And it's story after story after story. Secretary Clinton had a serious disease. Multiple sclerosis. Hillary's going to cause nuclear war. Murder of 30 people. Funding ISIS. Smuggling drugs. Untrustworthy. Pedophilia. Crooked. Hillary Clinton is a she-devil totally creepy falsehood. Sometimes we found in the United States our greatest strength, free speech, open societies, uh, democracy, can also be one of our greatest vulnerabilities. I don't think we were fully aware of the impact, the effects that it was having. So much of it seemed surreal, ridiculous. By utilizing our openness, they exploited us. If people that I knew personally to be thinking thoughtful people, if they were sharing the propaganda, who else was sharing it? Everyone falls for fake news. I've fallen for fake news. Over the course of the last 75 days, the top 20 demonstrably fake stories uh, got more Facebook likes and shares than the top 20 campaign stories from mainstream media. And laid the groundwork for Sanders supporters to say, I've had it. They actually have won over a segment of the US audience like Russia's never won over before. A uh, white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where as they chanted, it. Recent polling indicates that 49% of Republican voters, I'm sad to say, believe that, that Putin and that Russia are either an ally or a friendly nation. The question is, who helped guide the decisions that the Russians were making, what ads they may have bought, what kinds of fake news they thought would be most effective? If you know the, the personality of the people you're targeting, you can nuance your messaging to resonate more effectively with those key audience groups. This information is quite helpful to a campaign manager. Cambridge Analytica popped up growing out of an experiment, behavioral science experiment at Cambridge University to see whether they could analyze large numbers of people using Facebook because people are spilling their feelings to their friends, hundreds of millions of people in their pool. We have somewhere close to four or 5,000 data points on every adult in the United States. We can see where these people are on the map. They were able to take that to micro segment. You belong to a group of 12 like-minded people, exactly like you, who are interested in the same things around the country. These are people who are definitely going to, to vote, but they need moving from the center a little bit more towards the right. You're not supposed to go into Facebook and, and harvest that kind of information. 
Cambridge Analytica got its Facebook data in a sort of quasi-legal way. We can look at what issue they care about. Gun rights I've selected. That narrows the field slightly more. And now we know that we need a message on gun rights. It needs to be a persuasion message, and it needs to be nuanced according to the certain personality that we're interested in. They were very involved in the Brexit vote. We saw the Russian bot armies, the trolls, have a very pro-Brexit message. There have been allegations that Cambridge Analytica supported it through a small office above a pizza shop, which is not exactly the kind of place you'd think would be the center for international intrigue, unless it was just a cutout for somebody much more consequential behind it. Cambridge Analytica is owned by SCL. A larger and much more sinister global election tampering operation using big data and technology. SCL is in turn owned by shell companies that you can trace back to Dmitry Firtash, who again is tied to Moglevitz. That would complete the entire string and show crime boss Simeon Mogilevich involved, starting out with pure and simple money laundering in 1984 with Trump properties, going forward more than 32 years to the election in which this data mining firm, Cambridge Analytica, is playing a very, very big role with the Trump campaign and helping him win. that of the two candidates left in this election, one of them is using these technologies. And it's going to be very interesting to see how they impact the next seven weeks. Thank you. One of the big investors in Cambridge Analytica is Robert Mercer. He's a hedge fund billionaire. Cyber scientists on the outside noticed this server that was configured in a very unusual way. That was a direct link, essentially, from a Russian bank, Alpha Bank, and Trump Tower. That would obviously explain a major path of communications. Trump Tower, they seem to have premonitions of, of things that were going to happen that, in fact, did happen. Roger Stone in August saying it would be my turn in the barrel while he's simultaneously involved with WikiLeaks. I actually have uh, communicated with Assange. Uh, I believe the next tranche of his documents pertain to the Clinton Foundation, but there's no telling what the October surprise may be. It's October 7th, 2016. Three major things happened. The Department of Homeland Security and the Director of National Intelligence made a public statement and said the government hacking during the 2016 election was none other than the Russian Federation, and that this decision could have only been made by Vladimir Putin. On the same day, the Access Hollywood tapes were revealed. I don't need to wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. After those two things, a third thing happened. John Podesta's emails were released. WikiLeaks posted more than 2,000 additional emails from Hillary Clinton's campaign chair, John Podesta. I never heard from the FBI until two days after my emails started getting released. He said, you may not be aware of this, but your emails have been hacked. I said, yes, I've been watching it for 48 hours on every cable store, you know, uh, in the country. Uh, that was actually the last time I talked to the FBI. There was a lot more that was coming out that we were aware of that we couldn't get the press to pay any attention to. I tried in my speeches and then culminating in the third debate. Look, Putin, wait, wait. from everything I see, has no respect for this person. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet, no puppet. It's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's pretty clear you won't admit no, that the puppet. Russians have engaged in cyber attacks against the United States of America, that you encouraged espionage against our people, that you are willing to spout the Putin line, sign up for his wish list, 
rake up NATO, do whatever he wants to do. We went into election day believing that we had a lead in the popular vote, which proved to be true. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, we felt like we had a lead in all those states, and that proved to be not true. So he won by a combined total in those three states of 70,000 votes, and gave him the presidency. Sorry to keep you waiting. Complicated business. Complicated. Знал свое поражение на выборах президента Соединенных Штатов, Соединенных Штатов Америки, с чем я вас всех и поздравляю. До конца шел, хотя никто не верил, кроме нас с вами, о том, что он победит. Вот. During the transition, Jared Kushner met with a sanctioned Russian bank. Gorkov, the head of that bank, got his training not in the Bankers Academy, he's a trained KGB agent and its offices all around the world are always understood to be providing cover for Russian intelligence operations. What did you really speak to Jared Kushner about in New York when you met him in December? The Russian bank said they talked business. White House says they talked future U.S.-Russia relations. If he was doing this for business purposes, it would be a violation of the law. And if he was doing this for political purposes, there are serious questions about whether he or anyone on the campaign were working with Russians during the interference campaign. The crown jewel for any intelligence agency is to recruit an asset inside your adversary's intelligence agency. Because that person can, of course, report on intelligence operations against your own country. For Donald Trump to put Michael Flynn in the role of national security advisor shows that they were extremely incompetent in their vetting of an individual who was working as an unregistered foreign agent on behalf of Turkey, who had extensive ties to a foreign adversary in Russia and wasn't disclosing those ties, or that was one of his highest qualifications and Donald Trump uh, liked that. I was uh, invited to take my old job as CIA director back. I learned that I would have had to have reported uh, to the president through Mike Flynn. They uh, pressed me to go to a particular meeting where there were several Turks present and it was clear they were thinking seriously about taking into custody a Gulen in western Pennsylvania, which would have been completely illegal under American law. I told them that and left. I decided I did not want to report through Mike, and so I turned down the, uh, the offer. President-elect Donald Trump sent out an email announcing his pick for Secretary of State. ExxonMobil Chairman and CEO Rex Tillerson, despite concerns over his close ties to Russia. I mean, this is a guy who was given a friendship award by Vladimir Putin. Uh, and I have a very close relationship with him, which dates back almost 15 years now. I believe that Rex Tillerson was chosen by Donald Trump for primarily one reason. He would not stand in the way of Donald Trump's prevailing policy interest, which is to align the United States with Vladimir Putin's regime. And I think that's exactly what he's done. He's facilitated it. Putin and Rex Tillerson have been trying to put together a $500 billion Arctic exploration deal. ExxonMobil has won a highly coveted contract with Russia's Rusneft. No, my philosophy is to make money. <laughs> and so if I can drill yes. uh, and make money, then that's what I want to do. But it was put on hold by the Obama administration when the sanctions were imposed. One of the fascinating things in that dossier, still sources told them that Rosneft, a big Russian oil company owned by the state, that 19% of it was going to be sold off and that there'd be money for people who were able to get U.S. sanctions removed. Well, sure enough, in December, that percentage of Rosneft was sold off in a method by which involved shell companies in the Grand Caymans, which are non-transparent and which you can't penetrate. Only someone in the highest echelons of uh, Rosneft would have had access to that information. And obviously, somebody talking to Chris Steele knew a lot about it many months before it happened. The Russian hand in these influence efforts, ultimately, they'll try and hide it. And they do it with two methods, putting them in jail 
or killing people off. Arrests in which people were dragged out and had black bags put over their heads, charged for treason. These people may have been Chris Steele sources, or Russian intelligence may have suspected that they were. The day after Christmas, General Oleg Yervinkin, who was the chief of staff of Rosneft, was assassinated in the back of a car in the center of Moscow. The head of RT English, mysterious death in Washington, D.C. A Russian diplomat stationed here in the New York City had actually died on election day. You've got an obvious interest on the part of the Russians. And of course, on the other side of the equation, you have all of these contacts going back to Russia, whether it's Roger Stone, whether it's Flynn, whether it's any of these folks, there is simply way too much smoke for there to be absolutely no fire whatsoever. I forget how many tentacles is that. <laughs> it's just sort of, any one of these is a massive story. It's unrealistic to think it's limited to what we know now. Rather than look at this as one isolated of money laundering after another or one criminal appearing after another, I think it's much more than that. And what you have is probably the biggest intelligence breach in the history of the world. So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. of Vladimir Putin. That is the near challenge that we face as Americans. He has tried to deliver for Russia. He wanted to take off sanctions immediately. I was in the administration for the first five weeks of Trump, where, among other things, I was responsible for the Russia sanctions. And I'm one of the people who was worried that the Trump administration would suddenly lift the sanctions unilaterally. And I stand by it now. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to have been in a cover-up to see when somebody is acting like they're covering up. This man is clearly and conspicuously doing so. I don't know how a president could handle the situation worse than President Trump is now. His actions at the G20, his talk of maybe getting in a cyber partnership, You don't go to somebody who just punched you in the face and then offer them a favor. Мне кажется, было бы не совсем корректно с моей стороны в деталях рассказывать. Trump has to have known he was compromised. He's got to know the eyes of the world on him. And suddenly, all these forces will be out to expose him. I cannot imagine living with that every day, you know? The Trump campaign's biggest potential exposure is going to be in their financial dealings. It's very hard to cover up money trails. The other one is obstruction of justice. Collusion is a media shorthand for could be aiding and abetting. Uh, conspiracy, it could be uh, aid and comfort, which is treason. The Russia story is a total fabrication. What the prosecutors should be looking at are Hillary Clinton's 33,000 deleted emails.
it is ongoing. The Russians' efforts here are continuing as we speak. We've done zero, absolutely nothing, to protect us from a future uh, cyber attack with respect to any election. Zero, we haven't done anything. As long as people can do things without penalty, they're going to continue to do them. We all have a stake, because it may have been the Democrats and me this time, it could be the Republicans and their candidate next time. Every single national security official we've talked to has said, they're coming back. We have to be ready for that. If the people don't demand that, if they don't demand that our sovereignty needs to be defended, our representatives in Congress are gonna kinda look the other way and move on. What's at stake is truth. What's at stake is government that's accountable to us and the cause of liberty at, at, the, at the most profound level possible. We owe it to uh, the people who have fought for and sacrificed for this democracy uh, to be guardians of it uh, and make sure that we always have free and fair elections. Thank you.